and welcome back. I'm Dr Dawn and I'm at the Barn Theatre behind the barn door in Sirencester for Couch Confessions with Dr Dawn. Uh, and before I introduce my next very special guest, I thought I'd start this show with a little um, health tip, perhaps, because my phone has gone slightly mad and my surgery phone is very busy with people who are so scared about the news and the rapidity of easing lockdown and the implications that that might incur. So it's a slightly lateral health tip today but what I'm going to suggest is that if you are getting anxious about that kind of thing that you limit your screen time. Perhaps just identify one particular news programme, clock into that each day and then turn it off, turn it away because actually you can get a bit swamped by all the health warnings and, and, and worries. So that's that for now and now to the exciting stuff because I've got a really special guest today. Uh, TV comedian and travel writer and my fellow islander on Bear Grylls Celebrity Island out in Panama about four years ago, it's Dom Jolly. Dom, hi, how are you doing? Hello, Dawn. It's nearly as hot here as it was on our island. <laughs> but we're not quite as humid, I suspect. Not quite as humid, no. And I I've had something to, to eat as well, so it's good. I have to say, you look amazing. You're somebody who hasn't put a single pound on during lockdown. Well, actually, I did. My first 50 days, I piled it on and it was really bad. I was drinking more than I normally do. I rarely drink at home, but just because of the weird circumstances and everything, being in there, I just like having a sort of bottle of wine was quite a nice thing. And anyway, I did. I definitely put on some pounds and I wasn't feeling great. And then uh, I was trying to work out what I could do. And I've never been a runner. Like I'm not built to be a runner. I'm no greyhound. I'm a barrel on sticks. I never thought I'd run. I'm 52. And then I found someone recommended this, actually an NHS podcast called From Couch Potato to 5K. And it's just been the absolute saving thing for me. I could just walk out my door, put the headphones on, and it literally tells you, walk for five minutes, run for five minutes. And it built up and built up. And, yeah, that was six and a half weeks ago. And I've just done my first 5K, so I'm feeling very smug. Fantastic. So, so you've actually lost yeah. weight in lockdown overall, have you? I don't know. I think I've probably just levelled out, but, you know, <laughs> which is more than I thought. But you're looking very upbeat, so lo lockdown hasn't been too unkind to you. No, I've, I've actually, I mean, obviously there's sort of aspects of, you know, ahead, there'll be problems. I think financially, it's, I was in the middle of a tour and it was cancelled and there's lots of things that have stopped. But actually, I've, I've, it's sort of been weird, a bit like for the earth. You know, it's been a sort of holding pattern and I've been at home with my family and I thought that'd be a recipe for a disaster because I'm always travelling. And actually, we've all got on pretty well considering... It's been really nice, actually. It's been, it's sort of different, made you reassess things a little bit. Not too much, but, you know. <laughs> and how's Will, because you've got a, a house pig, haven't you, Wilbur? I don't anymore, I'm afraid. Oh, Wilbur is dead. No. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. That's all right. And then I had two new pigs, Sir Francis and uh, Stanley. But when I moved from my farm, I've just moved into Cheltenham, I thought it'd be a bit much to bring my pigs <laughs> into town. Uh, it's difficult enough adjusting to be a townie. So they've moved in with my neighbours. Uh, and they're very happy. And they're literally on the road into Winchcombe, so I can just drive past and wave at them. So I see them. You still see them. OK, and you've yeah. got the dogs. Yeah, my dogs are here right now, lying around. Here's my puppy. There he is. Oh, and there's the other lovely. One. Lovely. So I took, I took them river swimming yesterday, and they were very excited by that. So that was really nice. So, I mean, you, know, you said it's about as hot at the moment um, in the UK as it was in that awful island off the coast of Panama that we found ourselves on four years ago. The island where we, was, we were trained for a whole day to build, bam, to learn how to build bamboo furniture and hunt with bamboo and start fire with bamboo, only to be dropped on an island with no bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> and in the water off the island, not on the island. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, I didn't mind that. I, that was all right. I mean, I, I kind of, in, you know, looking back on that, obviously I'm chuffed that I didn't walk because there were times where you think I just want to get off. And it was an amazing experience, but I wouldn't say it was pleasurable, but it was just nice to know you could just about get through it. So I do remember um, when we came back from the island, Dom, we were looking at a, a property and decided to go to the local pub. Uh, and it was actually, the series was being aired. And as we walked in, um, there was a, a small group at the bar and uh, and obviously one of them identified kind of semi-recognized me and sort of mentally went straight to celebrity island and you say we we were useless i was sitting down and i heard this voice say 
um, are you watching that Celebrity Island with, with Bear Grylls? And one of the others said, um, no, is it, is it any good? Oh, she said, it's absolutely hilarious. He's taken these 10 celebrities and put them on the island and they are beyond useless. <laughs> I felt myself shrinking. Well, but it's true. But I mean, how, you know, why are we supposed to be good? I mean, how the hell have we been trained to live on, a, on an island knowing nothing? The only thing that saved us was we had crew embedded and crew just tend to be uh, just a little more practical than we are. But, you know, what? Well, well, I, like, I, I think it's, it's weird when people see those because often people see shows and ask, is it fixed or is it whatever? And I'm just like, you know what, till you've done that show, then come back to me and tell me how good you are. Because it, uh, it's by far the toughest thing I've ever done. I mean, I've done a lot of weird things, but that was the hardest 14 days of my life, definitely. Yeah, actually, I don't tend to watch myself on telly, but I did watch that, and I remember screaming at the screen, going, it was so much tougher than that. Because... Oh, it was way tougher than that. And I remember screaming at the screen, just thinking, Jesus Christ. Because, I mean, it, the moment you're back, you forget just how exhausted you get. That was the weird thing. But we just looked pathetic. Well, I did anyway. <laughs> uh, the only thing I was pleased with, I'd watched enough uh, other shows to know that you could set fire to a, an ant hill. Uh, and then travel with fire. So we did travel with fire, which was pretty good. That was but apart from that, yeah, it was terrible. And I did catch a fish, but it was a poisonous fish. <laughs> but apart from that, nothing. <laughs> I remember at the time you saying, because of course you've done The Jungle as well, and you yeah. said that it was much tougher than The Jungle. Well, The Jungle, it's weird, because people say, you know, oh, is The Jungle fixed and stuff? And it's not fixed at all. Um, it is exactly as it is. But, but the difference with The Jungle is, worst case scenario, you're given minimum rations a day you've got water you've got beans and rice so actually you know i loved it i lost some weight uh i mean the real problem with the jungle is boredom actually and julian mckeith but we won't get into that um but actually the jungle is is set up to it's very much run on a hostage mentality because the whole point of the jungle if you watch it when you see ant and Depp talking to people you if you look at their watches they've got tape over their watches and i asked them why and they said because time is a luxury the whole concept behind it is to keep when you first walk in you're absolutely freaked out and you're having a panic attack and i'm not comfortable here. and after two days you adapt to your camp so much that when they try and move you it really unsettles you and it really i, I think that is exactly how hostages must feel actually when they take you to trials they take you in blacked out buses we call beirut buses so it's a very it's a different dynamic from from uh uh from uh, the island but a lot of it i think with all those things depends on who you're in there with as long as you've got someone you can have a laugh with then it's normally okay and you had some good pals when you were in the jungle well i was really lucky because i think any other series i would have killed someone but um on this one i had sean Ryder, who was fascinating nigel havers who had no idea what was going on so it was endlessly amusing we had stacy solomon who was just lovely and then i made really good friends with jenny eclair and we were very similar so it that really helps and then you know we had brit eckland lembit opic i mean it was just insane you do wake up and just think what am I doing with all this weird assortment of people? And just looking over and think, she was married to Peter Sellers. And of course we had just, we were all not worried about who was the baddie because we had Dr. Gillian McKeith. So that was easy. <laughs> and we, you were there when, when the faint happened. Oh my God, she'd been building up for it all the way through. We had to walk, it was a live trial and she walked all the way down. And I, you know, I know a liar when I spot one and she was setting up the lie going, oh Dom, I feel a little faint. Oh really? And then she got there, and then she did the faint. No one faints like this. Oh. And then when she was on the ground, she just tugged her, her shirt over her tummy. She was an appalling human being, I'm sorry. <laughs> so not on your Christmas card list, then? Very much not, no. <laughs> Tom, I remember when we came back from the island, joking apart, because it was, it was pretty brutal conditions when we were there. Um... It was mentally brutal. I mean, that, those are, those are serious... I mean, you know, they say, we're going to drop you on an uninhabited island. You've got to think, why is an island uninhabited? Because it's uninhabitable. You know, the water they put there in, in the little water things, uh, and they had to put food on the island. There is nothing there. But it was, the, it was the sand flies that are the nightmare. Well, that's what I was going to talk about, was your leg. Because when we came yeah. back, I mean, how is it now? Because weeks and weeks after we came back, you were still struggling with this um, rash from sandfly bites on your leg. Yeah, I mean, it was about that size, just below my knee. And it was just like a gaping, seeping wound. It would have gone straight on one of your shows, very nicely. <laughs> um, and it was terrible. And in the end, I went to the School of Tropical and um, 
tropical a place we're all much more familiar with now the school of tropical medicine and hygiene i can't remember the name of it but in in london and uh the guy said it was essentially just a really really it, it had sort of multiplied itself i thought they the sand flies had buried eggs in my leg or whatever but it finally went um but i kind of i still have this sort of pattern of dry skin there and it flares up occasionally it's very odd even now four years down the line yeah 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 wow wow yeah so would you go back if you were asked to go back well i just can't say no to things i mean everything in me would say no but um yeah of course i would i mean i just it's such an incredible experience i mean it's amazing um you know i'd like to go back with different i'd love to be able to choose who i went on with because it would be incredible I mean, there were a couple of people that really irritated me, and I'm sure I irritated them, but, um, you know, that makes a big difference. But, no, it's just such an amazing experience, the whole thing. There's no way you could say no to it. I find I have got very strong memories of, even on a deserted island, you managed to find a huge piece of plastic that might look like a mobile phone and do a little trigger-happy sketch on the beach. Do you remember that? I do remember that, but I mean, that was one of the saddest and, and weirdest things of it was that we are, you know, we were miles out in the Pacific on this archipelago, no one around. And yet you just walk down the beach and the beach, uh, as people that were, that were stranded there, it was amazing because you found, literally, you actually found half bottles of Coke still with Coke in it. And everyone managed to get flip flops, although they were odd ones. But the amount of detritus, especially plastic, that washed up on those beaches was just terrifying. Yeah, it was actually, wasn't it? And this is all before the Blue Panic movement. I remember we 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 all, so there were 14 of us, weren't there? And we all had yeah. pillow-sized pieces of polystyrene to use as pillows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> but the stuff you found on there was just astonishing, actually. And it just makes you realise, I mean, just how polluted the sea was. It was crazy. So let, let, going back to Trigger Happy, because obviously, I mean, that was kind of... It was just, a, I, just an iconic moment for me, you being on a deserted beach with this huge piece of plastic um, yeah. doing a Trigger Happy sketch. How did Trigger Happy come about? Uh, it came about because, well, I, I did my life the wrong way around, really. So I did serious first. I was a diplomat in Prague and then I worked in Parliament for ITN as a producer and I was doing quite serious political journalism. And then I got fired from ITN because I was interviewing David Meller and I, I was just bored and I got a friend to kick a football and it hit him right in the face live. And IT, ITN obviously <laughs> fired me. And so I was looking around for a job uh, in, in documentaries. And just by chance, I went to a production company that were making this show called The Mark Thomas Comedy Product. And it was the very first kind of Michael Moore type show. And because I had a political background, they wanted me because we were going to take on MPs. And the first day, uh, I think we tried to see what you could take through a McDonald's drive through a tank, a clown car, another hamburger thing. And I just remember thinking, I can't believe we're being paid to do this because I'd do it for free. And I think I just got the bug. And so when that finished, I started doing my own stuff on a Paramount comedy channel and it sort of built. And I had about two years of really trying stuff out. And then Channel 4 spotted it and, and basically Trigger Happy happened. And we were, I was just me and Sam were left alone for a year to do our show. It was amazing. It, it's kind of that perfect thing where... When no one is expecting anything from you, it's amazing because you're just left alone to do it. And then the moment you become a success, everyone gets in on it and tries to change it. And it ends up very difficult to make anything. Uh, you're talking about a different Sam, but we shared a makeup artist in Sam White. Um, we did, yeah. Ago. And I remember her telling me um, about a scene... Um, in one of your shows where you were outside a, a famous sports um, chain uh, and asking all the people arriving in trainers to take their trainers off. And you actually managed yes. to get people to do it. Yeah, that was outside, I think that was Reading. And it was outside a, yeah, a trainer shop, actually. And we asked people, basically I was just behaving as though it was a nightclub. And then I think I also moved on and told people that the shop was closed for an hour because I always pitch, pick on Alan Titchmarsh just because I think, he probably isn't that sort of person, but I always, I always love doing sketches in which Alan Titchmarsh is presented as an appalling person. So we closed down the whole shop and wouldn't let people in and said that Alan Titchmarsh was trying on trainers and he didn't like to meet civilians. <laughs> and he didn't, like, he didn't like civilians seeing his bare feet. And everyone's like, what? And I go, I'm afraid it's just the way Mr Titchmarsh is. And they were like, what? Who do they think he is? <laughs> so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And who comes up with those ideas? You or a production team? Or is it a brainstorm session? How does it work? No, uh, they're all me. <laughs> and do you do that at home? 
I don't really have a process. I just, I, I kind of, I suppose since I had an iPhone now, I just, whenever I think of something, I'm just walking around and I think, oh, that would be funny. And then I just put it in my notes. So I've just got a list of things. So, so you know, I think, oh, Milkman, uh, be a doorman somewhere. That would be funny. And then I just have a list and I, we try and make them happen. Really. There's, I, I'm very disorganised. Are you a practical sort of joker with your family? No, I, I'm kind of, I mean, I've kind of over practical joking, to be honest. I haven't done it for quite a long time. I do more travel writing now. And I was never a, I was never a practical joker at home or anything. I kind of, practical jokes don't really make me laugh. It's not that. It's more kind of surreal situations, really. That's what makes me laugh. It's about trying to turn normal life into just a very, just slightly odd, different dimension. That's what makes me laugh. So the Dom Jolly that's not a comedian and was a diplomat, is it true yeah. that you were at school with Osama bin Laden? I was at school with Osama bin Laden, yeah. I grew up in Lebanon and I went to a uh, an English Quaker high school built by Quakers from Darlington, of all places, in 1860, called Brumana High School. And I went and I was there for a year before I got sent off to boarding school when I was about eight. And when I went back, I did a documentary, I went back to Lebanon and into Syria and I went to the school and I was wandering around. Uh, I thought the fixer had sorted for us to be able to film there. And the headmistress comes zooming down and she's livid and she's screaming at us and saying, who are you? What are you doing? So I was a bit like, oh, well, I'm sorry. I, I presume I'm your most famous old boy. And I'm just looking around. And she looked at me with disgust and said, most famous old boy? I don't think so. I go, well, who is? And she goes, Osama bin Laden. And I went, OK, fair enough, you win. But then she backtracked because obviously it's a Quaker high school. And if you're a Quaker school, you know, they're pacifists, probably your ideal thing is not to have Osama bin Laden as an ex-pupil. But yeah, when I was six, he was 16. We were there together for a year in 1975. But obviously I don't remember him. I mean, he didn't look, he didn't look as he did then. So sadly, I don't have a picture of me and him. Right. Well, sadly, I don't know. Is that sad? <laughs> I'd love a picture of me and him. So you were due to be on tour right now. Is that right? Yeah, well, I was in the middle of a tour. I was about a month and a half in and I had another month and a half to go. And then suddenly I could feel it coming. And then just I uh, got home for a day off and then never went out again. So, yeah, it's been it was really weird and very annoying as well, because I don't tour. I don't really do much live stuff. And this was mainly my second tour ever. And I'd really nailed it. Actually, it was about travel. It was called Holiday Snaps. And it was just lots of weird clips and photos, including our island experience. I had a photo of my appalling leg <laughs> just to show people that it was real. Um, so, yeah, I was really enjoying it. So it was a real shame, actually. So, and, so the travel writing is kind of another aspect. How did that... Well, I've always, I've always written, and what I've always wanted to do growing up was write. And obviously, after Trigger Happy, I wrote for The Independent for 15 years. I've travel written for The Sunday Times. I've written for all sorts of people. Um, but travel books were where I was always going to head, and I wrote a book called The Dark Tourist, in 2009, way ahead of the Netflix series that stole it off me. And I went off on the sort of holidays that people don't normally do. So I went to Chernobyl for the weekend, North Korea, skiing in Iran, war crimes tribunal in Cambodia. I kind of love odd travel. And then I wrote a book where I went monster hunting and I went off to the Yeti and Bigfoot. And then I've just written a book called The Hezbollah Hiking Club, where I walked across Lebanon. Uh, took me 30 days to walk the length of Lebanon with two friends. So I just love going to places where really there aren't any tourists. <laughs> and probably a good reason that there aren't. <laughs> yeah. So what's next for you? What, what, what are you going to go back on? Are you going to complete this tour when all the restrictions yeah, are well, eased? Or? We, re we rebooked the tour for the end of this year, but that now looks unlikely. So now the tour is looking more likely to kick off probably March next year. So I've got about three months of touring next year. I'm just finishing a book about England, actually, having been to over 100 countries. I've kind of ignored England. So I've been driving around England and I'm writing a a book about England. I'm writing a sitcom at the moment that's been optioned by Working Title, which is a bit odd. I've never written a sitcom before. And then I'm just getting my new book together where I'm going to follow the uh, cricket. Uh, I'm obsessed with cricket. So I'm going to Australia on a road trip and uh, it's called Ashes to Ashes. And I'm just going to follow the Ashes, Ashes series round and kind of write, hopefully, a funny book about cricket, but also Australia. Amazing. You don't take my little yeah. boy with you, do you? He's cricket mad too. <laughs> My boy's absolutely cricket obsessed and he's so jealous. So he's not going to come as your bag carrier? No, I'm going with two mates, but I'm going to hopefully fly, the, fly him out so he can come to the uh, Boxing Day test. I hope so. Are you going to be away for Christmas then? 
Yeah, I'll be away for three months, yeah. Wow. OK, so yeah, so your family really are used to you being away for a lot of the year. I'm, I'm always away. This is the longest I've been. This is the hundredth day in lockdown today. And what would, and what would Stacey say if I asked her how it had been? Uh, actually, so it's been much better than, than we all thought. It's been rather nice, actually. It's been really good. I mean, she loves me going away. She likes having the house to herself. And I love going away as well. But actually, it's been really, you know, we haven't had a choice and it's been brilliant. You know, it's really good to catch up with you. Um, I'm going to close up with one quirky question, and I'm sure you'll have 100 answers for it. Yeah. But knowing what you know today, what would you yeah. tell your teenage self? Buy property in London, as much of it as you can. <laughs> and don't sell. <laughs> Just buy it. Buy everything you can. And then, because it's the most annoying thing, like the thickest boy I was at school with, had a flat in London and he's just sat in it for 30 years and he's doing better than I am. I'm like, that's just really unfair. And I sold my flat in London. Well, I sold a flat. I've still got one, but I sold a big flat, which would have, could have been my retirement. I sold it to Salman Rushdie in a very weird move. Um, so, yeah, probably be that. And it would also be just lose the goth period. That was embarrassing. I had a three-year quite heavy goth period. No need for that. Cheer up a bit. Um, that's about it, really. I mean, everything else has been fine. I love the way you drop in names like Salman Rushdie and Osama bin Laden as though they're kind of everyday occurrences in everybody's lives. It's how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> Dom, it's so good to talk to you. Thank you so much. It's been way too long. Let's catch up again off camera or off mic. Yeah, when, when we're finally allowed to hit pubs, that'll be great. Well, it won't be long. It won't be long. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and take care. Great. Thanks a lot, Dawn. Look nice after to yourself. see you. Thank you. Bye. So that's the fabulous Dom Jolly uh, with crazy, crazy stories. Thank you all for listening. Um, I'll be back next week, week with Claire Lomas, um, event rider, public speaker and fundraiser extraordinaire, to tell her story of how she recovered from a really serious accident. So please do join me again next Monday behind the barn door at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester. See you then. Take care. <laughs>